I want to point out to you tonight how absolutely material and physical all of this is. That no matter what you thought it was in the beginning, no matter what you may imagine it is now, no matter what you may have read and thought about even before you ever heard of me, all ideas of some sort of change outside of losing weight or changing your diet, everything else strikes people, the potential, as being spiritual. That is the most common catch-all term, whether you thought it was religious or not, your idea was any kind of great change other than absolutely observably physical would be of some nature spiritual, that is invisible, that is spooky, weird. Maybe some of you could stretch it far enough and think maybe it'd be psychological, which is the same thing. There is a serious flaw in the way in which you look at things unless you can understand that everything is material. If you even take my historic equation of I plus not I equals everything just on the surface of the way it looks. The not, what your forefathers, scientists used to call the ether, the not, the space between what appears to be you and everybody else is not space, it's not emptiness. There is a medium. It is never taken into consideration, but there is a medium there. There is a reality to it or else among other obvious, the basic obvious one, how could you convey feelings? It should be enough for me to just ask, how can you, how could you convey words were it not for there being some material entity, that there is a material reality between what appears to be you and everybody else, or you could not tell somebody, hey, I like you, or hey, you get stuffed. Verbally, you couldn't do it. But now forget about the sound waves. That's enough. But forget about the sound waves. Let's really get into a strange area. How is it that you can turn to someone and go, <laughs> and they get the message. You can do it without even the facial gestures, is what I was attempting to convey, whether it got on the videotape or not. But somebody makes a statement about their opinion about world affairs, and you turn on them and go. <laughs> All right, let's even be more subtle. You do surely but now understand. You know this. You've said it somewhere in your life at least to yourself, even without these subtle facial expressions. You can be just sitting around with someone or walk in a room and you'll have a distinct feeling beyond any room for debate that some particular person doesn't like you and they don't have to be going. You can, I assume all of you should know this, you can make somebody feel. You can get behind somebody on a bus. You can stand at the bus stop with somebody. And it's not that hard to do. And you can turn around, I'll just use everyday terminology for you people, and you can imagine, just try and hate this person, a stranger. Just hate them. And people will turn around. They will feel it. But you're just sending out hate, hate, hate. Hate, huh? No great trick to it. You can do it. And people will, they know something is happening. I simply want you to face up to the fact that there is no empty space. There is no deadness. Now, several of you newer people have already asked me questions about life on other planets, that sort of thing. You don't have to even worry about that, specifically. It is all alive. There is nothing dead. If you can be conscious of it, it is alive. It is alive. There is no emptiness, and there is actually another level of interpreting that equation because the not is not really a separation. It's as though, if you could see it with a further dimension, it is as much that we are as fish are in, a, in water, you just can't see it. And everything that is occurring is sending, it is operating as a, in the medium between people, and everything that happens some way affects you.
I'm going to leave that for the time being because there's no way to trick you into this and it is so simplistic that there is really no way to talk you into it. It simply requires a new form of consciousness on your part, being able to turn the increasingly complex into the increasingly simplistic anew, is to see that there is no empty space. The song continues. There are no measures somewhere where the whole band drops out. There is no silent place. There is no dead space going on. There is a particular way I'll conclude this intro by saying that yellow circuit consciousness could not operate were it not for the illusion that it has some breathing room. People would not be conscious. You would not even, nobody would have done this, for instance. We would have had not, never had the great breakthrough such as someone developing underarm deodorant. <laughs> Unless there was the apparent reality of a separation between I and not I, between you and everyone else. As long as you've got a physical difference, as long as the person is not physically embracing you, then there is some distance that you can run, you can hide, and you can't. There is nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide, regardless of what Martha and Vandella said. <laughs> people attempt, people attempt in extreme conditions, you might say, to be a hermit, to physically put difference between them and life. And probably a fair number of you people have had passing sensations when you would hear or read about a hermit and nod to yourself like, I can dig it, I can understand that. But hermits don't get away from anything. Don't you understand that internally they're being triced or they wouldn't go so far as to try to get away from it physically? <laughs> so anytime you think that a hermit, you read about some mountain man or somebody that's retired from life and left his job as a banker or a surgeon and went out and has been living off by himself and never comes into contact with other humans but once every decade. If you think, well, boy, he's got the right idea, you don't know what's going on internally with that guy. No, you got to do is have some awareness of what must have been going on internally in him to make him go that far. But to think, to have some idea that he's sitting out there on a mountaintop with no radio, no television, no mail delivery, and boy, that must be a great relief not to have to fool all this kind of mundane shit that goes on every day, you are wrong. He might as well have the CNN network, the news going on in his head, turned up full blast, almost nonstop. You got to understand that. You, you'll be able to suspect that once I point out, or he would not have gone to that extent. <coughs> there is nowhere to run to. And just because you might seem to be wired up or want to be, to the point that you try to keep everyone at arm's distance, that you try and be non-committal, that you try to stay disinvolved, that you try to be, as they call it in some generations past, you try to be cool about it and not get all that entangled with other people's affairs. You're living the same kind of dream that hermits are, physical hermits. Between you and everybody else, it might as well be jello. It might as well be water. There is a medium there. You've got to understand it. And it does not even have to be on the basis that apparently fit into the observable five senses. That's what I was trying to give you when I said that you can, without any gestures, without any facial expressions, with no sound, no touching, you can, you would think of it as send out emotions. But you can do it. Now, you won't really harm anybody if any of you have got to try, but you should hear what I'm saying. You can go into a public place, into a restaurant somewhere, and just turn around to somebody that has their back to you and just try and send out hostility. I don't really like having you people do that. Or you can try it this way. It's a little harder. It might take you another minute longer. Just send out, turn around, turn around, turn around. It's a little harder than sending out hostility. Hostility has a certain joie de vie. It seems, <laughs> it seems to have, it has, it has its own power. But you can just send out what is, uh, would apparently be, I guess you would call it, a motion of just turn around, turn around, look at me, look at me, and just be motionless. And you can make people, and they don't know why, because it is something physical. It is not something invisible. You just can't see it. And it's not anything spooky. It's not anything spiritual. It's just that which is operating 
in a dimension that ordinary senses cannot pick up. And therefore, all these years, it's been referred to as being spiritual, metaphysical, occult, now new age. I want to pick up some more. If you recall my latest drawing from last week, is that yellow picking up on tape? Does anybody know? Ben, is it? Remember I was drawing the blue line sphere of influence? Everybody remembers that? And remember I was drawing this, that the actual sphere would be like that. Which although that does not look much like you, even an x-ray, believe it or not, that is a fair representation. I wanted to point out a few more things. You've had a few days to think about it if you thought about it. The reality of this, you can see as being the basis of the wired up human inclination to believe in gods and religions and philosophy and psychology. Psychology being the closest thing to probably a yellow circuit religion for today in the city. But I want to point out several things specifically that has a pertinence that you can use. At first it may sound as though I'm just again dismantling history, giving you a parallel view. All of the ideas, the myths, the ideas of gods, all of these stories, when I say myths, I mean everything from the religious stories to that which in the Western world now we simply refer to as myths. There is a reality to them. At least you think that I've been trashing religion all this time. There is a reality to it, but here's what it is. It is the yellow circuit's attempt to make use of memory from the older red circuit's nonverbal memory, but it's from the red circuit cellular parts of the DNA that was actually there when the stuff happened. <laughs> so, as easy as it is now in the city for ordinary people, to laugh at religion, and of course, probably everybody, to smugly smile at the idea of mythology, that that's not even as up to date as religion. What you're dealing with is this certain cellular parts in humanity, individual and humanity's DNA that was in the red circuit level prior to the activation higher up of the nervous system for man to pass for what he is now civilized, that is, conscious man. And there was your red circuit DNA, you and everyone else, was there 10,000 years ago, was there and witness to events that it has a memory of, but being nonverbal, it can't speak for itself. And so it ends up with an interpreter. It is almost like a ventriloquist dummy, except the dummy, in one sense, you've got to be able to now work yourself into an attempted view of coeval four-dimensional reality of things happening simultaneously at different times from a 3D view in different places from a 3D view. But as some of you may know, all you've got to do, at least you think that I carry things too far, all you've got to do is get down to just take ordinary science into the subatomic level now, and that's not all that strange according to their theories. That's their theories. I'm telling you a fact. It's a funny fact. You have the memory and a part of life's nervous system and a part of you and a part of humanity that has memory, but nonverbal memory is almost irrelevant. It is almost an impossibility as far as the yellow circuits are concerned because the yellow circuits can't remember anything unless it can talk about it. At least any of you have any doubt if that was too strange. Even now, 
to artificially split up man into the red, yellow, and blue uh, circuits. If you are functional enough at the red circuit level, then you should understand this. You can learn to do something that seems to be a physical task without any verbalization. That is, the better you are, the more well-founded and the healthier you are in the red circuits, in the nonverbal functions. If you want to learn something, to juggle, to stand on your hands, to walk on your hands, you would simply find somebody to do it and you wouldn't waste time talking about it. You would watch him do it, and that's it. There's nothing to talk about. The yellow circuit cannot operate on that basis, not because it, it should, not because it has any weakness. If it cannot talk about it, if it does not have a name, if it does not verbalize it, it cannot be conscious of it. It can be aware of it. It can be aware of the body being able to pick up something. It can be aware that you may be trying to take up a hobby, learn to drive a car, learn to juggle, learn to walk on your hands, and suddenly the red circuits. I remind you one more time, this is all artificial, of me cutting it up like this, but it does point in a proper direction. But the yellow circuit may suddenly be aware. You've been trying to walk on your hands, off and on for two months. You watch people do it, you even bought a book and it verbally told the yellow circuits, do such and such, do this and that. So you read it all, you read it all, and you thought, all right. And then you keep trying. You get up against the wall, and then you get away from the wall. Then you fall down. You keep on and on, and it doesn't seem like you get anywhere. And then one morning you try it, and suddenly the yellow circuit wants to holler, Eureka! Because it can tell, hey, you got it down there. But it's got to say something. The red circuit, if it could exist in isolation, cannot talk, but it's got memory. The reason I'm spending all this time, uh, much of what passes for mythology, well, let me be more specific, all that passes, if you understand what I mean by mythology, including religion, tales, has a basis, but it, the basis is the nonverbal memory of the older, lower circuits. And the yellow circuits have and are still trying to make use of this memory. And so the tales are not absolutely irrational. They're not completely fallacious. You've got to recognize them for what they are. They are a youngster's, relatively speaking, they are a youngster's attempt, a very talkative, very loose-lipped youngster's attempt to make some use out of nonverbal memory of a very ancient compatriot who is nonverbal, but who was actually there at the time. There is a use for that, believe it or not. <laughs> While some listening with 3D ears might think that I had for a moment eased up on religion, for those of you who thought I'd been leaning on religion, let me point out something else. The whole idea of gods, which as far as doing something revolutionary, is just irrelevant. It's not that this kind of activity is hostile toward it. It's just irrelevant. It's just in your way. But let me point out, the notions of gods are still coming from the same situation. And even in the city, the notions of God takes bad raps. That is, there is more to it. There's something that even a revolutionist, a would-be revolutionist, can learn from. One is, one way to look at it, where it, for ordinary people, were it not for the notion of God, now this includes atheists, people who say they're atheists, if you'll listen to me, if were it not for the notion of God, ordinary people could not conceive of any possibility of change inside this apparent closed-in system. Now, they can say they're atheists, but they have a concept of God under another name, or else ordinary binary consciousness 
could conceive in no way of there being any possibility of change when you're dealing with a closed, what seems to be a closed system. There's got to be a, like a black hole, a point of egress or of entry, a two-way, that something can get in here. Right, you're dealing with these kind of binary gridlock dances that go on and on of saying, uh, does man have free will or not? Well, I believe he does, but other people say that they don't believe he does. So, if we don't, then I am just made to believe that we do, and I'll never know better, and those that say that we don't, they could be victim of like predestination, that they don't really have any free will, and so nobody could ever know that sort of thing. That wasn't good enough, all right. <laughs> that it matters who runs our country. In our country, we vote. So everybody should go vote because it matters. But then if you get just a decent look, just ordinary uh, reports of the news, something seems to, some calamity strikes even the executive branch of our government, something terrible. Now what happens? It's good for the news for what? Two or three days? Everybody forgets it. So you can look from one viewpoint of last body, there are those who stand up and say, it's very important who runs things. And another part of last body can say, it doesn't make it down. All you got to do is look at history, and it doesn't matter. Things press on. Things seem to be going on. Were it not for an idea of God, I can see here at least in person, I have not hit the right threshold enough of you. I'll try it another way, but were it not for the notion of God under whatever name, people could not, ordinary people could not have any picture of there being a possibility of change. Everything would be like in a gridlock. It would be like the binary opposites of everything, of good and evil, free will versus predestination. They would stay in a gridlock dance. There would be no way to ever see the possibility of change. Well, let me try another one more aspect of taking up for the notions of gods. One is throughout history, and you could look at this as being an ever-increasing time of this kind of attitude, that the ideas of gods is very unscientific. To put it real crudely to yellow circuit people, from their view, is irrational, insane. But from another view, it is the height of rationale, because were it not for the notion of gods, the yellow circuits could not reason. They would be locked in this gridlock. <laughs> the yellow circuits would never have grown were it not for a notion of God under some name. It has been, if you understand it all, the safety valve. It has been the weak spot wherein the yellow circuit could expand because if it could not, the, even the yellow circuit would be tied to in a death-defying dance with the question of opposites with a binary view of things that have either got to be true or false, and there's always as much proof one way or the other if indeed you could have a so-called objective view of it, a clinical view of it. There has to be a kind of weighted standard of thought. There has to be the feeling that there is one side that has a greater preponderance of likelihood of being correct, of being true, of being <laughs> decent. But to do this, you have got to have some possibility of this gridlock of, of everything that the yellow circuit can think of, that this is down. They can't think that that's down until it thinks this is up. Then you get sideways on what's down and what's up. You stand on your head, and when you say this is down, that's up, somebody says, no, you're wrong. Then you get into this theory of general relativity, and there is no down, there is no up. For the yellow circuit to get anywhere, it had to have a notion of a God. There had to be a way in and a way out of this apparent closed system. So in a sense, as insane, as anti-scientific, as anti-yellow circuit are the notions of gods from another view. It is the height of reason, because without it, the yellow circuit would have never reached the point to reason. It would have never reached the point to be able to say the notion of gods is unreasonable. <laughs> This blue circuit, blue line, sphere of influence, I want to point out something else about that. 
that jagged area that I've drawn in is also a forum. And it is the forum wherein people announce themselves. You've all seen, if you haven't been to those esoteric affairs, where when you come in and all the guests come in, you are announced. Not to worry. People do it themselves. And that is the forum for it, is people announce themselves. People name themselves in that forum. It is wherein you attempt to establish and succeed, if you're ordinary. You succeed by announcing in this forum, and people listen. They have to, because you have to listen to them. It is the one public forum. It is a kind of internal Hyde Park. That at any given time, you can announce yourself. And then in turn, you have to, once you do it, and there is adequate apparent response, people at least going, hmm, hmm, hmm. <laughs> then it's your turn. Then other people come into this forum. They come in, they pass through, they leave, then they return some other time. It's your turn to, hmm, at the very least. <laughs> It can be. You can mumble about them. You can talk to your neighbor about them. You can complain about it. You can say, well, I wouldn't be here if somebody didn't make me be here, or you know, who cares who that is. But at the very least, you have to acknowledge the forum. You have to acknowledge their presence. You have to acknowledge the fact that they announced, uh, I. I am a mistreated Irish Catholic. Thank you, thank you, and they, and they leave. And that's someone else's turn. <laughs> Last time when I drew this, I took the approach of what I was talking about, about human apparent emotion, if you recall. I was pointing out that within the sphere of influence of the what I'm calling the blue line, the blue circuit, which the blue circuit really does not deserve a title of being a thing as much you know, in the same sense that the yellow and the red does. It is more a nexus. It is more a bridge between the two. But be that as it may, I was pointing out that specifically that such things as compassion and mercy and charity did not arise there. But let me take another small, slightly different approach, and let me point out to you that that forum, that jagged area, that sphere of influence is the place, is the source of all of the so-called, I'm saying so-called by you people's standard, by the city's standard, of all so-called unprofitable emotions, bad emotions, fear, sorrow, greed, envy, jealousy. That forum is their home base. That is the source of them. Because it does not come from here. Any area left within an individual that has not been touched by that. Since it cannot talk, if there was an area that I could verbally refer to as being a pristine red circuitry area, it cannot be jealous because it can't talk. Now, the reality behind jealousy can be there, and it might kick somebody's ass that touched their mate. It might kill them. But you can't ask if it's jealous because it does not talk. It does not daydream about jealousy because it can't daydream in pictures, it can't daydream in words that have names. That is, the pictures are the names. It cannot, that is the source, cannot be if there was still within an ordinary person an area of potential, just in the ordinary sense, of potential yellow circuit activity within a person. Because if it did not already have the experience that would put a name, it would put a verbal description on something, 
then it could not say it was jealous. It could not say that it was greedy. Everything that can be experienced in the city, everything that an ordinary person can experience emotionally, comes from this area. But if you can put it together from what I was pointing out last week, I have now excluded all of the so-called, or I intended to last week, I've excluded all of the so-called, what would we call them? Uh, higher emotions, better emotions, charity, love. That's not possible within that jagged area, within that forum. But now I'm trying to get you to see that with all, all of the ones that apparently are to be avoided, the very ones that are condemned by religions, by philosophies, by apparent common sense, likewise have their home there. I just want to point out to you what a marvelly, marvelly place that is. That is where people live emotionally. That is where people apparently live as individuals. It is the source of all so-called bad emotion, but also look at this. It is the very place, the very place that life insists everyone stay. <laughs> While simultaneously making the forum filled with voices crying out about against hostility, jealousy, egoism, feelings of self-importance, feelings of self-pity, everything that any human mouth has ever opened up and condemned as being a useless or detrimental emotion arises there, and it's there that life tells everybody, stay put, while simultaneously making them cry out about the very things that arise, apparently emotionally, from living in that location. It plants you there, it raises you there, and it tells you to stay there regardless of the fact that people apparently wander around in the forum and talk about leaving it, that is, seriously changing. Nobody does leave, because by and life, large life will not let people leave. See if this shows up. How about the real revolutionist as a land submarine. <laughs> a land submarine. that a part of even a real revolutionist has got to show, be above the water line. But then, as I believe they call it in the submarine biz, they would be running silently, but that below the water line still has areas that has memory. It has memory much older than any history book you ever read. It has memory much older than any dreams you ever had up here about gods, religions, UFOs, national inquiries. But it's below even the line of the submarine. And just as a submarine under certain wartime conditions runs silent, all the engines are closed down, etc., so that you can sneak up. The real revolutionist as a land submarine would be running silently you notice it does I drew a periscope it would be continually watching and maneuvering but a part of it would never be seen Since I talked about some religions and myths, can any of you see where the idea is, we would call this the Freudian age, to pick out an easy one to point you to, is how the idea, which is not all that unique or new with Freud, but is now in the Western world, it's attributed to that era, 
that there is some part of man, the subconscious, that there is some part of man that has never been or cannot be directly identified, cannot be necessarily taken into account, this behavior cannot be predicted, that it's back to the attempt of, from ordinary binary consciousness, that people do not operate apparently from your view, and you being everybody, individually. That humanity does not operate in a most beneficial way to the individual, does not operate in a way that is predictable from my view. And of course my view is the sane one. And so you have the concept that there is something below the level of consciousness. There is something egging man on, making him do things that at times uh, the things are unpredictable, that things they are apparently uh, self-defeating. There is a more descriptive, there is a more useful, it is more complex detailing of what's involved. And I'll also point out to those of you who can hear it that the idea of an unconscious is simply an updating of spirits, updating of demons, updating even of mythology when the gods used to get drunk and fly out people's noses and take over their bodies and their consciousness overnight for a week until they sobered up. Or, as a more modern philosopher said, Flip Phillips or Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it. My unconscious, my subconscious made me do it. It's simply an update of the devil made me do it. Well, what you're talking about, what all of those people are talking around the edges of is those factions in every individual, and all you are is a piece of the human race, a piece of a larger organism, the DNA that has a memory. You understand when I'm saying memory, I'm not talking about a memory of last week. I'm talking about a memory of thousands, thousands, thousands of horizontal years. It was there. It cannot talk. It could not talk then. It had nothing to talk about. It cannot talk now. But the gradual, the four-dimensional growth of the nervous system, the expansion that makes us apparently what we are now, the height of creation, has been a gradual process. It is not quantum moves to where man was once a feral, unthinking animal, and then through some kind of process through some kind of miracle, through some kind of great leap, he suddenly went from that to being human, or of the gods doing that kind of stuff, of spitting on dust, or the gods of the Western world looking out on the void and saying, let there be unvoid, let there be, <laughs> let there be stuff, and there was stuff. <laughs> Your DNA, if you was in touch with it, you have memory that knows better than that. It's not that that's wrong. It's just childish. It is bad reflections. It's the best the system can do. It's obviously the best that life needs from us, from ordinary people. But all of these dreams, all of these strange memories of you being able, even though you, some of you may still think I'm making fun of it or attacking it, that some of you can still pick up ancient so-called religious writings from 3,000 years ago and you can sit there and read it and feel chills at times, or to feel, as they used to say, there must be a God. Or why, does this, why did I read stuff like this and almost cry? Or why did I read such as this and become fearful? My heart pound just from these words, just from this ink on paper. And it's 3,000 years old. It's because you have nonverbal memory. You do. In your own cellular structure, parts of you were alive then. Parts of you were alive before what they were writing about, that they were writing about stuff that they thought they remembered. And they called it myths, or our forefathers at some misty past had these stories. There is a piece of you that remembers that. It was there, but it can't talk. And so now it has this verbal, it has this yellow circuit, attempted use of this memory. It is a continuity of the expansion of the nervous system, the growth. And so it's turned it now into verbal stories. 
to be able to use the situation as it is is why I came up with that, I guess, oxymoron again of the real revolutionist as a land submarine. Because you can't escape the condition of you having this blue line sphere of influence and that is a forum for everything that occurs in the city. It is a forum for all opposing beliefs, but it is a forum of which you can only be conscious through binary eyes that you see it all as being a matter of this or that. In the situation of being a the revolutionist as a land submarine is to be aware of the fact that there is a piece of you, there's a piece of everybody, but only a few people can even become aware of it, that there is a piece of you that is indeed still below, never been affected by this sphere of blue line influence. With everyone else, that is the basis of the idea of anti-gods, uncivilized behavior, and now the unconscious or the subconscious. To them it's just, you know, who knows where it comes from, how will we ever untangle it. And in the city, that is for most people, that's a fact. There is a way in which you can be aware of it though. You're just simply aware of it and there it is. And then much of what passes or what would seem to be the causes of guilt that you continue to have to explain yourself. You continue to worry about your sexual proclivities or peccadilloes. Are you worried about how is it that I try and fast and read holy books and still on a freeway, day in and day out, every time somebody swears over just a little bit, internally I kill them. Or at least internally I say naughty things about them in the privacy of my own skull. Likewise, the rest of the people have dreams that they don't know how to talk about. They don't know how to understand it. They can't talk about it. Of where humanity should be going. And then what they're talking about is the potential lateral areas in the nervous system as it is now that they can't activate. And that comes out in stories such as the belief in ESP. Uh, the belief that higher beings can talk through you, channeling, or that UFOs, People from other planets are coming down and talking to certain people, and surely they're going to get smart enough to look you up since you've got to be one of the prime people here on Earth that you know, believe in such things. It's not that UFOs is something to laugh at. <laughs> Unless we're going to laugh at God and Allah and Jehovah. It is a reality in the nervous system. But it is a dream of something that the nervous system presently does not understand and has no usable description, and so it has to use what it has. And what it's dealing with is a n another form, a new, slightly new form of guides, because every time they talk about people from other planets, it goes out saying that they're superior. I guess in most of these high-class, intellectually challenging periodicals like the National Star and all that, it seems like they always do say superior beings from another planet, but you know, it seems to be rather redundant. If they can get here, they got to be you know, fairly well advanced. They got to be better than the New York subway system in their modes of transportation. But at any rate, do you see, it's the idea that there are superior creatures, but 3D consciousness, binary sight, you look around, and let's say that you don't believe that spirits are talking to you or channeling through you and all that. You just look around and you can't find any. Or if there were any, they're all dead which is the way that song always goes. Well, yeah, there may have been some, but you know, Jesus, what happened since Jesus is gone? So, they're around us, they gotta be, since the nervous system is still knows that it's not at a cul-de-sac yet. And so the dreams now become, with many people, that they're somewhere else, spatially. They're somewhere else, and they're superior to us. It is the nervous system. It is almost like a retro memory, or like a retro, foretelling okay. 
that the past is the future, that this is the way it would be, this is the way it probably will be, except there is no, there are no material examples of it that I can see. And I no longer believe in gods. And I'm not hearing voices since I quit taking all that Benzedrine. But they must be there, so what am I left with? And then you, you hear about people that say they're in touch with creatures from other solar systems. There it is. Again, it is the notion of gods, or else the yellow circuit could not operate. The submarine would be like a person having a full understanding of how I was born into this and how that part of me is unchanging. The city limits, the boundaries have been established. There is no profit in trying to fool with that. The people who try to fool the city limits, the way it is, are people who become entangled with drugs. That is, become entangled with drugs while believing that it has some higher purpose. The real revolutionist as a land submarine would have that understanding, and he would also, or she would have the understanding, that there are parts, even under ordinary circumstance, that is right now, without me having made any real basic genetic change in myself, that there are parts of me available right now that everyone else finds inexplicable, which are not. They simply are, and they're outside this forum. They're outside the blue line sphere of influence. They're nonverbal. You have to use this still spatially. They're nonverbal here. They're non-existent here. It's still dreams. As I said, it's almost like retro forecasting. There is that which I believe even you newer people have heard mentioned that I could bring in here. Is MV12 and that's what we'll call this paragraph, MV12 and PLD, plain life dominance. Plain life dominance is this. It is the genetic factor back in the city that causes people to be leaders. It is the basis of what has been known in our generation as charisma. It is the same basis, it is a similar basis, not exactly the same, but it is a similar basis that causes one wolf, one baboon, to take charge of the pack. And it is not limited to the physical size. Some of the world's great, some of the world's outstanding tyrants have been rather small fuckers, as I assume some of you know. <laughs> it is not physical size, it is not strength, it is a genetic factor. And it has a, an effect in the nervous system. It is what makes great speakers, whether they be politicians, whether they be ministers, so-called ministers, spiritual people, comedians, baboons, it can seem to take over a pack. But one baboon or one wolf, and he's outnumbered. And he's got an inappropriate percentage-wise amount of the females. He gets all the first food. And he's outnumbered, 100 to 1. All the world's great tyrants. If you're not involved, it's easy for the nervous system of people not involved to say, how could some group of people put up with being controlled by this one madman in history, whether it be in the past or even today. Why do they put up with that? They could overthrow the government. Sure they could. It just shows that you don't understand shit. Some of you, I guess, are almost old enough to remember the great 50s in the United States, the Cold War, when it first started, and the great Red Scares, and periodicals. But you remember, periodicals and humans are simply what? They were filled in commentators saying, how is it that the Russian people, however millions they are, how can they be tyrannized right after this war, after they've seen the destruction of war and blah, blah, blah. How can they put up with not having free elections like we do? 
that they don't have the freedoms that we do, how can they put up with it? Jeez, what a, what a, can you imagine the devilish black power of Stalin and his minions behind every door with guns and knives to keep the people in line? It's not true. It's not what's required. How many times there's no doubt that they have to have what appears to be physical force on display, but that's not what keeps people in line. It's PLD. It is physical. It is material. If you're outside of it, let's get from politics. You can turn on TV. You don't have to go out and get yourself all muddy and splashed. See some of these ministers waving Bibles and pacing and hollering and screaming. And you can look at it and say, Jesus, what kind of idiots? And then the camera pans back and you realize the idiots have filled up. There's 70,000 of them you know, in New York City, Washington, D.C., San Francisco. You think 70,000 idiots. That's just in one city, though. That was just that one night. But to you, it's like, good grief. Those people must be, none of them have any education. What would possess them? It just shows you don't understand shit. There is a genetic factor, and it pops up. And it, you do not have to just limit it. I just started out, as always, or most of the times, with a tried to hit a glaring example. You do not have to look at people up on a stage as a minister or somebody up on a platform, a Mussolini, some dictator. Look at every situation going on in life. Look at those who start businesses. Look at those that get promoted in a business. To get a job, to get the position of being some kind of general manager who keep the job. To varying degrees, life is full of. As I've already told you, I know that many of you still can't see it and some of you don't even like the sound of it. It is a dominant submissive dance going on all the time. If you just got two people, somebody is Mussolini and the rest of them is Italian people. One of them is Joseph Stalin and the rest of them is the Russian people. That's simply a fact. You just can't see it yet. And it's not a judgmental fact. It's not bad in the person playing the Russian people. They're not being put upon. There's another view if you can't, oh, I'll throw this in right fast. The Stalins of the world, to again try to pick an example that will really annoy or some of you find difficult, the Stalins of the world feel as oppressed at certain times as the people do. You can put that way back somewhere and file that away. At any rate, even down to the level of two people, one of them has charisma at any given time. One of them is up on the balcony hollering, the trains are going to run on time and follow me. And at that particular time, the other person plays the Italian people holler, El Duce, what a guy, what a guy. <laughs> you have got that continually. But what I was going to continuing along with this being very, very, absolutely material, physical, real, and not spooky. There is a genetic factor that pops out more so than the average, more so than the ordinary dance between just individuals that make these figures that apparently can get up and lead a crowd that has nothing to do with rationale. It has very little to do with the yellow circuit other than they may talk words. See, what you don't understand is these Jimmy Swigerts, the Mussolinis, the Hitlers, get them all on TV, turn off the sound. Well, let me be more, let me be better. What? Drop you back in person there in the middle of a Hitler rally in a Jimmy Swigert. You know who he is. He's a flamboyant, one of the TV preachers. One of these people drop you out in the audience, in the midst of the people, and then pretend that I could turn the sound off. This deadly silence, you can't hear his words. And then let him do what he's doing, let the crowd do what they're doing, because it takes both. And you'll understand that words have almost nothing to do with it. But now catch this. Even parts of life body, as always, is already talking about that. Small segments throughout history of life's body that is, those who are more grounded in the yellow circuits, have said there's been people that wasted their time. I say this, life wastes its time also. But have gotten down and studied such things as Hitler's speeches 
now that the war is over and all that unpleasantness, and tried to figure out how in the hell could a bunch of people go for this? We have analyzed it. We've compared it to everything that's ever been said, every great speech, every poor speech. And what he said is just medre. It's just shit. It's irrational. It doesn't mean anything. Look at a minister. Look at the pope. Read the Bible. You can do that same thing from a certain view and say, how can a group of people get all inflamed? This is irrational. It doesn't mean anything. It's silly. It's just nonsense. <laughs> just a small little segment of people's always, that little part of life's body has always been saying to the rest of its body, kind of, whew, you know, how can I, how can I pull this on myself? <laughs> it is a crude reflection of what I'm telling you because the words in truth have very little to do with it. But what I'm trying to get you to see for these last two meetings is in here, what seems to be human emotion, what seems to be in a certain way that which makes man unique, not just his thought processes, but that man takes credit for being charitable, for having human feelings, and nobody else has human feelings. Nobody has feelings, no other creature seems to have feelings, even approaching humanity. And therefore it is something, per se, that is of great value. And I'm telling you to do something to change, not to become me, not to become anything I describe, but to actually change, to expand your nervous system and to find out to complete that which you want to complete. And you don't have to explain it to me. Now, I'm not going to tell you exactly what it is because you don't have to expand to some way to fit me and my desire if I had one. But your desire to change to fill up something that is now empty in you, you have got to get out of this. Not because it's wrong, not because you made a mistake to be there, you had no choice. But you have got to see that it is useless. It is a swamp. There is no way out. It is a gridlock, binary dance. We've got to turn over the tape and then I'll get to the other part of this paragraph of the MV-12. I'm going to leave this PLD factor, but I simply want to tell you as a fact, now I'm not, some of these that I don't stay with when I say I tell you as a fact, it's not for you to go away, of course, and try in some way to believe what I said because I said it's a fact. I'm telling you something that is not within the realm of 3D information but there is enough experience and enough nonverbal recollection in your own nervous system that you should be able to feel that I am touching on something that is quite real that is never talked about. That is, that there is a material something. There's not demons. There's not gods coming down to some guy, to a Jimmy Swagger or to a Jesus, if he was a great speaker. I don't know whether he claimed he was. Yeah, they did. That's right. But that he could get up there and whip an audience up it's not gods that came down, some spirits that came into him, nor is it demons and anti-gods that get into a Mussolini or a Huey Long or a Lester Maddox. <laughs> if you get past the words, you should be able to hear some of this. Down your own nervous system, there is a genetic factor, and I'm just calling it PLD, but it is chemical. It is a genetic factor, and it is as material as your own fingernails, your own nose and hair. There is something else. Now, MV-12, I have described, I'm not going to stay on it much tonight, but I have simply described in the past and touched on it off and on with the older people. As strange as this is, I'm just going to tell you this is a fact. There is a substance that the blood produces that comes from certain genetic factors that I have called for reasons I've never described and it's not important, AMV-12. This substance is used up as it flows through. You remember my older drawings of the nervous system? in the line level of consciousness, to use that, then I would point out, this is not, of course, physically exact, but it is a fair representation, that by the time your blood circulates and gets to the level of consciousness, MV12 is used up. It is depleted. Now, the level of consciousness 
has risen quite mechanically, your level of consciousness, using you as archetypical of Western man or woman right now. This line is higher than it was 100 years ago. 100 years ago it was down here. This part, this certain substance in the blood was used up. Some of the reasons it was used up are the requirements down here. Life is now easier on the red circuits, and so the level of consciousness can rise, can get higher mechanically. And it rises in conjunction with, now your consciousness wants me to say, speak in matters of cause and effect, and say that the line rises because of more MV12 reaching the brain. It's more complex than that, but it is coeval. It would appear to be that either that's the cause of it or that's the effect of consciousness being higher. There is a substance. It is used up when it reaches the level of consciousness in humanity, and it is depleted when it is, reaches your level of consciousness. It goes through the forum. It goes through the blue line sphere of influence. You are you, and it uses up. Every time your heart beats, it is using up that substance in the blood. Now, just as I properly point out to you that the factor that seems to cause out in the city, in ordinary life, leaders, people with charisma of some kind, that there is a genetic factor to that, there is also a genetic factor having to do with MV12 in the blood it produces what appears to be the good guys, the spiritual leaders, those that have some charisma, those that have some ability to do something. But not just out publicly on a stage, the individuals, that is, the revolutionists who can benefit from this. One of the ways that I was at least wanted to touch on, that's why I brought up MV12 tonight, is that the change that takes place the spiritual leaders, those that have some charisma, those that have some ability to do something, but not just out publicly on a stage, the individuals, that is, the revolutionists who can benefit from this. One of the ways that I was at least wanted to touch on, that's why I brought up MV12 tonight, is that the change that takes place, assuming that your suspicions, whatever they were, and it doesn't matter, were correct before you met me, that yeah, it's possible to do something extraordinary. And you may, God knows what kind of dreams you had, that you need to get to be a channel for somebody from another planet. Or that you had to look at crystals and make them you know, blind you in the eye and put you in a trance. You know, who knows what? It doesn't matter. It's not necessary that I'm speaking about now with MV12 of the kind of apparently charismatic leader that's going to become a new Jesus or a new guru, so-and-so. We're talking about you. For you to change, for you to undergo this kind of genetic shock that is quite real, it is not spiritual, not in the sense that you always thought. It is not hocus-pocus. It is not even invisible. And it is certainly not incomprehensible. Not to me, because I'm telling you how to do it. You have got to have the MV12 in rich blood get to lo your level of consciousness as it is now, and that is how it grows. Everything that you do now, everything, I don't give a goddamn what it is, everything, whether you tell the truth all the time or whether you lie all the time, it's the same thing. Whether you eat too much, whether you don't eat enough. Whether you eat meat, whether you don't eat meat. Whether you drink or whether you don't drink. Whether you're a man, whether you're a woman. Whatever you do right now is depleting. It is using up. It is a marvel of scientific precision. Because everything you do, the amount of time you sleep individually, the amount of exercise you get, the amount of hostility in which you seem to engage, the amount of apparent charitable works you do, whatever it is you do operates at such a point of precision that all of the MV12 is used up right when it hits your level of consciousness. 
Life keeps you right where you are. What you have physically got to do is not pray, chant, find some secret potion that somebody mixed up in Tibet, not find some ambrosia that the mythical gods left a recipe for 5,000 years ago, not to burn candles, not to have certain incense, not to hear voices. It is something quite crude. It is in the blood. It is from a genetic factor, and it pops out in a few people, very few people. So few people, it's insignificant. Just look at me. Look at you. You want ideas of insignificant? <laughs> but it is as material. It is as, to some people, gross and yucky as blood. Real parenthetical, I hate to even encourage any of you people's strange imagination, but how about this for an aside? How about all these stories throughout all religions and all kinds of mystical and would-be occult groups about fooling with blood, like drinking some superior creature, some godlike figure drinking his blood or rubbing his blood on you? I don't know why I just thought of that. It doesn't mean, means nothing. It is as material, it is as basic as blood. But everything you are doing now, everything that it takes to prop up Fred, everything that it does to keep Fred or Mary active in the forum, to continually step back in the forum when it's your particular turn and now it's, yes, it's me again, and I'm still upset. <laughs> yes, it's me again, and, and I'm still mad. Yes, it's me again, and I'm still a serious seeker. Whatever you're doing, you are depleting the MV12 that was in you, assuming you correctly belong here, that you had more than you should have to start with in life. But you are still depleting it. And you deplete it by being you. That's the way it's arranged. That's enough. That's as much as I ever talk about it at one time. But I want you to understand the reason I put them together and start off with the PLD. Surely all of you can try not to resist what I'm saying too hard with that, that they're apparently in life, out in the ordinary world, back in the city, for good or ill, has been these charismatic people that seem to just be natural leaders, for good or bad. And then you might be around them and even feel a piece of it. Maybe just on the level of, God, what a great speaker. He almost had me voting for him, and I'm a socialist. He almost made me want to contribute to the church, and I'm an atheist. You know. It's also true, and you've got a piece of it in a different way if you're properly drawn to this. We'll assume you are. But it is not plain life dominance. Because the point of this on the individual level is not dominance back in the city. That's why, again, this may be too far aside right quick, but all the great apparent organizations and people, et cetera, that you've ever heard of in history, they weren't all that great, or you wouldn't have heard of them. It's just justice at work again. <laughs> those that really, those that do revolutionary things for themselves are too quick for history. It operates at a different tempo. It's got nothing to do with ordinary dominance. It's got nothing to do with ordinary apparent leadership or whipping up some kind of crowd or some kind of following. That's not what it is. But there is a connection, is what I want you to see. To what I am referring to as the MV12, which is a substance actually in the blood that comes about through a certain genetic factor in some people, is a parallel to another factor that comes out in quite ordinary people that produces the apparent leadership of the city. All the way from your small time ward boss, county commissioner, all the way to the more infamous tyrants of history. But it is all, again, quite material, quite real, quite physical. It is tangible. It is visible, if you could see it. How about some unrelated things? All right. <laughs> 
I hate to get real far behind, see, because every time I meet with any of you people here or anywhere else, and I begin this, I never give inside gossip to this kind of business, do I? It's always behind. That's my joke about we could stay here forever. Because when I start one thing, I could do, I could keep on in other directions. So here are things that have been lingering around for the last few weeks for you newer people I started. Either that or I'm just making it all up as usual. I hadn't thought about any of it before. But here it goes. You should have an interest always in what appears to be the topology of life, of why things seem to always be limited in certain ways. And verbally, things are always limited to certain choices, alternatives, and it seems to cover it. For instance, any enterprise slash organization, either one, how about this? They're limited in what they do to only two possibilities, no matter who they are. And that is, they can either deal in goods or services. And that's not the point of where I'm going, but you and your people, I am serious. I'll mention this in other ways, but you should be interested on your own. As to the apparent to topological limits of what takes place in life. Why is it only limited to this? As smart as I am, why can't I come up that some organization, some business, some enterprise, there's got to be at least one more, at least under one condition somewhere, that what they're offering, that you can go avail yourself of, for whatever the price is, something that is neither a good nor a service. And yet, left with binary consciousness in the 3D world, there ain't none. But now back to what more of my point was. <laughs> Since all enterprises, all undertakings, all organizations can only deal in goods or services, I have a question for you. What are you to life? Are you a goods or are you a service? <laughs> Now let me point out something else. The price of all services, I mean the price of all goods, can you see this? That the price of goods are not really the price of the goods. The price of the goods are the price of the services. That is the labor that it took to make the goods. You're not paying for the goods because all goods are free. They're just laying around. Your automobile is laying around. You might have to take a shovel and dig down two or three feet in the right place, but your automobile is laying around. You can get it free. You might have to go outside the city and go on public lands or go out west in places where nobody can see you and protect their property. A house. Your house, the biggest investment, as they say on TV, the biggest investment you'll ever make. It's free. The damn thing's laying around on the ground. You can go pick it up. It's out there. Anything that is basic, that which, if you could see it, native, if it is ingenue goods, whatever the hell that would mean, it's free. It's just laying around. So when you actually buy goods, do I have to remind everybody that we're not talking about goods? We're not talking about houses and cars. You know that, don't you? <laughs> that when you actually go out and buy goods, you're not paying for the goods. You're not paying for the chrome, the aluminum, the wood, the linoleum the fiberglass, or else you're an idiot because all that stuff's laying around. It's just laying. You can go pick it up. You do know that, don't you? It's free. It's just laying there. Now back to my, what I found to be a curious question, to life's enterprise, are you a goods or a service? Are you laying around free? Or has life had to put some labor? Has life had to whip you into shape? Because obviously going out and staring down into a strip mining of copper, go around, to, go around to a forest and look at it, you don't see a house. Somebody's got to whip that lumber into shape. What are you to life? And those of you that really get keen-eyed is what are you to you? Let me tell you a joke. I 
don't think I've ever repeated this joke. Some of you may have already heard it because the joke is just one of those accidental things back in the forum of the city life that is so good that it should have been the basis of a religion. That is a little old guy in his car in the middle of the night on his way to an important meeting, just gets outside of his hometown, Pittsburgh, we'll say. Middle of the night, his car breaks down, and he's close enough that he can walk, and he sees this all-night service station, and sure enough, the guy admits he's kind of a mechanic. He says, I've got to get to Cleveland. Will you come look at my car? So the guy goes out and looks at the car, and he says, well, he said one thing, he says, it's your carburetor. I can rebuild a carburetor myself. You won't wait around here for an hour or so. And he says, well, is that it? He says, I've got to be to Cleveland. He says, if I let you do this and I pay you, will you guarantee that my car will get to Cleveland? They'll get me to Cleveland. The guy says, well, no, but I guarantee the carburetor will. <laughs> that is more than a joke. Let me, ref let me refer you back to something I've already pointed out to you. The kind of change that this is about, the kind of change that you believe you're after, you have got to deal with the entirety of the organization, of the enterprise. When you speak of change, you have got to be. You've got to try yourself now and have that view that you're speaking about the change of the whole organization. You cannot deal with the parts. But that is a part of the grand illusion, that is a part of the limits of binary consciousness, that the only change possible, the only way to better something, such as the automobile, I'll fix the carburetor, and at least the carburetor will get to Cleveland, I guarantee that, which of course part of the joke is that's irrelevant. The man says, you guarantee that my, if I let you fix my carburetor, are you guarantee that the car will get me to Cleveland? You guarantee the car, the entire organism, the entire enterprise will get to Cleveland? The guy says, no, but I guarantee the carburetor will. And of course, that's ridiculous. The carburetor can't go unless the entire thing goes. That's part of the humor. You cannot deal with the parts. But yet, what does life tell you? Well, if there's any way to change, if there's any possibility of self-improvement, you've got to be reasonable, right? Right. You got the one thing at a time. First, I'll save up and get my nose bobbed and my ears cut back. Then I'll go on a diet. And then after that, that'll take me about 1992. I'll cut down on smoking. I'll get more exercise. That reminds me of politics. Does everybody, well, a certain aspect. In general, in the legislative process, there is known as, <clears throat> well, it being the executive branch, where they could exercise what is referred to as line item veto, coming from particularly budgets submitted by the legislative bodies in our part of the world, that they're the ones that normally come up with the proposed budget for the enterprise, for the organization, for the city, the state, et cetera. And you've got two possibilities. Line item veto is the person, the executive, the governor, the mayor, the president. You've got your own. Either has line item veto that can go back piecemeal and say, well, that carburetor costs too much. Take out this program, take out that program, this one's all right. It's either that or you've got to reject. If you don't have line item veto as part of your structure, you've got to totally reject the budget. You can't do it piecemeal. So let me ask you yet another rhetorical question. On which basis do you operate? On which basis does humanity operate? On which basis do you think it would be most profitable to operate? That if in some way you had the ability to line out and veto, that you go and strip yourself of all your clothing, all your opinions, all the unnecessary baggage, and stand in front of a mirror and pick out the parts you didn't like. Not just the parts you could see, but all these parts. Temper, self-pity, fears. That way, line item veto, which right now is ascending in popularity. Or would you be left with a more old-fashioned way? You got to accept the budget as it is that the legislature sends over, or you got to reject the whole thing. You can't deal with it in parts.
I'll leave that to you. Partially connected with all this, let me point out another one. Is that life probably pays the most attention to those that do so to it. <laughs> and let me tell you the prime way that you could execute that. And that would be for you to activate the new data that I'm putting out, that I'm giving you. And what that amounts to, you gotta listen quick, is being able to turn apparent goods into services. <laughs> but in the forum of ordinary life, in the dreams of ordinary life, that's not required. Not by a large segment of people. That's a segment of people that believe, if you recall, if I can refer back to myself, and I don't know who's going to stop me. I can't even stop me. <laughs> that there seems to be the possibility for change based upon either new information itself or simply new directions on how to behave differently. <coughs> All right, goods would seem to be new information. <coughs> that, ooh, he says things periodically, if not continually, that I'm just sure is of great value. I want to remember it. I want to write them down. I want to think about it. It's a piece of information that is surely of use. You think life needs any more goods? And worse than that, remember what I already tried to point out to you, that goods, in a sense, are misnamed. That goods are simply services, all piled up. They run up against time. People do not pay a price for goods, they pay for the services that apparently turned all this free stuff laying around into something else. And you run across time, you run up against time, I do not have the time to go out there and dig up or to pick up all the stuff and fashion it into an automobile. Therefore, I will pay $20,000 for the goods, but you're paying for the services. This new information that life lets seep out that some of these people have this kind of submarine in some way. That there's almost a genetic factor working through a periscope. There's a way in which this enriched blood can reach higher parts of the nervous system that are, in a sense, of no particular use, except to the person involved. And that which seems to be goods to everybody else becomes services. <laughs> At least that sounds too obtuse. <laughs> well, what good is all this going to be eventually if all you do, if, it, if nothing else, you just keep collecting all these strange, weird ways that I seem to have of looking at things. That you just, you compile a huge outline. Maybe if we stay together long enough, hundreds, thousands of pages of all these little facts and these little witty things I say. What if that's all there is to it? You've got the goods. Then you can say, well, I know everything you know because I've written it down. I wrote all the good stuff down, so I got the goods. You got the goods, now I got the goods. What you got? If you can't turn the goods into services, if you cannot activate the info, what have you got? refer back to city literature. There is a phrase that I have run across, and I'm sure you people have. Been around for thousands of years, as long as the human nervous system has been talking and writing. And that has to do with the, and I'm quoting somebody here, I don't know who, but I can, I can remember this much. The quote, grief and fear of human existence. End quote. I'm sure the copyright has run out on that, so the author will have to forgive me. But somebody wrote and said that long before the existentialist philosophers of our century. But everybody's nervous system should be able to respond a little bit to that. That even if right now you're in a pretty good mood, you can feel something 
of some serious, some literate person especially, somebody who's been around, somebody who's seen the human drama, been through wars, famines, good relationships, somebody's been around to say, to speak of the grief and the terror of human existence. Now that's all right for the city. It's inescapable. It can even pass, that little fragment, can pass for being insight, can pass for depth of thought. But let me tell you, to this land submarine of a would-be revolutionist, outside the limits of the city, the grief and the terror of human existence is one thing, and that's boredom. Now, that's a city word, and so you've got to remember that I mean more than that. But it is boredom is the closest human word. But now let me tell you, and this is not to bring up another form of how you might be suffering your own grief, because it does not fit into grief and terror. One of the ways to look at your responsibility once you begin to taste any reality to this, not as a collection of goods or facts, or that you're no longer worried about, or you're arguing with yourself that, boy, what strange opinions I got, or where did I get these? You can begin to look upon the matter of boredom. Let me phrase it as another rhetorical type question for you. Could you believe that it might be dangerous for life to let you be wired up as you are and having little moments that some of the MV-12, as a matter of fact, hits your level of consciousness, and then simultaneously for you to be bored? Could you conceive of this, that life might not like that at all? Life not liking that at all might make life not want to believe in you. Don't you remember, I've already pointed out that ordinarily people cannot believe anything they don't like. I've never pointed that out to you yet. That defies all reason. It's worse than that. It's just nonsense to the city mind. And yet, if there's anything to you, you can hear some of that. It's got nothing to do with intelligence. But in the city, if you do not like something, you will not believe it. And you can argue with me or yourself all you want to. That, well, I can take into consideration new ideas and new theories that maybe I don't particularly care for as soon as I hear them, but I can go ahead and pursue them and weigh them and look at one side and the other, and that is just absolute horseshit. It just shows that you don't know anything. You've never even looked at anything. Because you cannot, if you don't like it, and forget why, there is no why, but in the fact that you're alive and you're in the form of the city. If you hear something and you don't like it, you can't believe it. That's it. That's, the end of the, that's as close as you'll get to a period in ordinary human consciousness. So, what if life doesn't like you? What if life begins to not believe in you? What if life also, which would fit in, leaves you in short-term memory, and that's all you are. If you believe that any change is possible under those conditions, then you don't understand that whatever life's attitude toward you is, is what your attitude toward you is. You bore yourself. You can't remember yourself in any kind of long-term memory. That is, you have no sense of 4D time consciousness. Your whole life is episodic. That's the only way you sense yourself. And as long as it's episodic, you still have this cut-off, isolated sense that time is the past, the present, whatever that is, and the future. You cannot believe in yourself. Now, I don't mean that in some psychological way. I don't mean that you don't have any faith in your abilities and all that. I mean you actually don't believe in yourself. You don't exist. You're a voice in your head. You're the dreams that go on, the chatter in the yellow circuit. 
and you walk past a plate glass mirror when you're walking down the street and you glance around and you sort of know that's you, the, that glass must be kind of concave to make you look that much overweight, but you know, that's kind of you. But you don't believe in you. You don't really exist. If you bore yourself, you don't have to grieve over yourself and you don't have to be terrified of yourself. You don't have to grieve over life and you don't have to be terrified of life. The danger is, from a revolutionary view, is not grief and terror, it's boredom. Now, as I said, I mean more by boredom, boredom than you would ordinarily think. Let me tell you what it is. Boredom is not fulfilling your potential. Now, I'm not talking about back in the city, remember. Back in the city, they talk about that kind of stuff all the time. But back in the city, everybody is fulfilling their potential. Everybody. Those who say, good grief, what we should do in life is fulfill our potential, and none of us do. That man, that woman is fulfilling their potential. Those who write books, the titles of which we should all fulfill our potential, they're doing it. Those laying in the gutter that glance up in a moment of semi-sobriety and see up in a bookshop window a brand new bestseller called Man's Only Hope is to Fulfill His Potential. And the drunk looks up and says, get stuff. And then passes out, he's fulfilling his potential. I don't mean that. What I mean is by you to uh, initially have this kind of insane urge, this kind of meaningless feeling as though my head seems to want to explode at times or it seems to want to go somewhere else. And you keep chasing all these strange ideas they have in the city and these methods and these philosophies and whatnot, religions, and none of it works. Then for you to hear a piece of it, for you to begin to think, I've got the goods, or I've found some place that the goods do exist, and then you do not turn the goods into services, you do not activate it, that is boredom. That is boredom. And that is what is the grief and terror to a real revolutionist. That there is still that part of your own DNA, your own cellular history, is still alive enough to know <clears throat> that all this is based upon the same kind of foundations as mountains, volcanoes, continents, and where it is going is exactly where the cellular basis of life is going. To know that and then to act otherwise, that's boredom. And my advice is this. You didn't ask it, but hell, I'll give it. My advice is don't fool around with life and do that. I'm just telling you, because life may forget you as fast as you do looking up that number for the pizza delivery, and you remember it long enough to go over there and dial it, but by the time they deliver the pizza, by the time you eat the pizza, somebody could put a gun in your ear and you can't remember the number. That's what you're fooling around with life. And you're also fooling around, although it didn't seem to mean much to many of you at the time, for life not believing in you. Because if it don't like you, it's not going to believe in you. And I, let me just ask you, do you like things that bore you? <laughs> well, I'm here, let me point out something else. Since I'm always encouraging people, and I'll continue to, to pursue hobbies, Back in the city, within the realm of the blue line sphere of influence, life will generally only tolerate hobbies that are generally meaningless. <laughs> Such as people attempting to change themselves. How about the one, since I already brought this up within the last few hours, a few days, you are what you eat. Now, there are people that's made a hobby out of that wrote books about it, set up communes, have little philosophies based on it. Life allows that because it's meaningless. Or some apparent system or some uh, offshoot of some religion of love is the answer. Life will only tolerate, generally speaking, hobbies back in the city that are meaningless. A real revolutionist has got to be able, through this periscope, has got to be able to see that by and large, generally speaking, 
The hobbies that are available, the activities available, are meaningless. Except they certainly do not feel, they are not discussed, they are not described as being so. Contraire. But the real revolutionist has got to be able to feel in himself. Got to be able to hear it, recognize that these goods are valid, and then turn them into services within your own nervous system, that every ordinary hobby, everything you ever pursued, did not produce what it said it would. If life generally tolerates it, it's meaningless. That's just a fact. Except in the city, that's beyond insanity. But it's a fact. And life's first story, your own nervous system's first story, is absolutely otherwise. Especially if it is a widely held, a widely respected hobby, like religions. Then it's got to be meaningful. Just perhaps you hadn't found the key yet. You haven't pursued it diligently enough. If you need such hobbies, I certainly would not try to discourage anyone from going back and pursuing it, but I'm just trying to save a few of you some time by giving you one of the good absolute facts. That if life generally tolerates a hobby in the city, then you can count on this. It's generally meaningless. That's the only reason it tolerates it. While I'm giving out facts, let me give you another fact. Since I haven't been letting Kairut I haven't been bringing in his missiles and messages to you new people yet. I'll take some of his kind of material. I'll give you another fact. Anybody that's alive that displays any talent whatsoever is a prodigy. <laughs> so much for education and practice, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, a couple more quick things. Uh, be sure and tell me about five minutes. I got an epilogue. Let me tell you something very specific. Some of you newer people are beginning to apparently get some direct benefit in what seems to be your, forgive me, California, interpersonal relations relationships. Yeah. You should look upon other people as being loyal selves faithfully doing the bidding of a larger cellular organization. Although it is not this simple, but from a 3D view, you could look upon there being that which has never been identified, but I'm saying you would be comparable to large, or at least organs. If you remember just in the biological sense back in the city, they describe organs as being larger collections of cells, and then into tissues, and then into organs. But you could look upon what would amount to organs in the body of life being equal to man's groupings. Christians, Democrats, Socialists, Jews, sad people, mad people, good people, bad people. That the individuals, contrary to there being any culpability, any way in which they should be condemned, any way in which you and your great Moments wherein you pass through the form and holler, yes, it's me again. You remember me, insightful, me, who can't be fooled, good old me, eyes like an eagle. Is to look upon other people as being quite faithful, loyal, admirable cells within a larger organ. And they are doing the bidding as they should, of that organ. Except rather than it be a liver, the organ may be the Democratic Party. Instead of the spleen, it may be the Catholic Church. Instead of the colon, it might be Albania. I'm sorry. <laughs> some, some of my best Albanians are Albanians. I don't know why I said that. I 
I do not mean that as some attempt at positive thinking or some way to try and affect your own yellow circuits to say, well, I'll think nicely of everybody. I didn't say anything about thinking nicely or that I'll try and forgive people for what they do. Who the fuck do you think you are? You're going to forgive a liver for livering. You're going to forgive a spleen for splaining. You forgive you for youing. People are faithful servants. When you're back in the forum, you are too. If you had that kind of 4D mirror, you wouldn't laugh at anybody else. Nobody. Not for some spiritual reason. Not to be moralistically a better person. You simply could not. There is nobody to laugh at. There is nobody in the world as funny as me. There is nobody in the world as funny as you. But when you're in that condition, there is no one in the world who is more faithful, who is more diligent to their duties. Nobody. The drunks, the priests, the rabbis, the tyrants, mothers, fathers, kiddies. They are loyal, faithful servants doing the absolute bidding of a larger cellular collection. But the collections here go by names, as I've already described. Families, humans, Fred, Mary, Republicans, Russians. There is a parallel that would not, I'm just putting words that would not exist in that level, but it is, these groupings are comparable to what would be organs in the life of body, in the body of life. That is what individuals are. Does that have any connection to the fact that anyone alive with any talent at all is a prodigy? Well, certainly it does not. I don't know why you even brought that up. Well, just oh, silly me. I guess we better cut the tape for a short epilogue. Fifteen? Well, we'll cut it down. Anyway. And by so saying, I did. To the, you got it? I mean, they're all rolling. Oh. Can you do that to me? For all I know, have you been doing that to me? <laughs> Flash, epilogue. Uh, one thing I want to mention that everywhere, in the other cities, here, older people, newer people, is anyone involved with this, seriously, is, if you feel it to any degree, and you have any kind of talent, You should feel and then you should execute a kind of obligation to everybody else. That is the public. I don't mean everybody else here. A kind of obligation to the public to entertain, to inform them in ways not unrelated to this. By whatever talent you got. Figure that out at your own leisure. Now I've got, on top of everything else, a new excursion for you. These excursions recently, I haven't pointed out, were aimed primarily at the newer people, but of course, the ones that I've already given out in the times past, I'll leave it to you people who were here then to do with it as you will. The excursion is this, for the next six days, there's something I want you to do specifically. Each and every occasion wherein there's the least possibility, now you know this, there's none to debate, you'll feel it, the least possibility that a conversation, just the passing of hello, how are you, between you and someone else, that there's any possibility this could take place. You got me? You're, just, you're staying in line at the grocery store and somebody happens to bump into you or just somebody you turn around and you're face to face and there's a feeling that it is quite possible that me and this other person, a stranger, that some conversation, it's very possible, something's going to pass like, hello, how are you? There's any possibility that you immediately feel that it could take place, or that you're just walking down the street, and you look up. And hundreds of people are going by, but suddenly you look up, and there's one person coming, and you feel that there's a possibility 
that me and this stranger, or this stranger and myself, are going to pass some kind of hello, how are you? If there's any possibility for the next six days, I want you, without fail, to first say hi. And, of course, smile. To anybody, you start the dance. If it's just high and you walk past them, but if, you, if there's the least possibility that you can feel, you're not trying to predict whether it will take place, but there's just the least possibility. Now, of course, this really has to do with, like, your place of business, your office, whoever it is every day that you pass some kind of greeting, you know, hello, good morning, half red. It's no matter how it's been going all these years, I don't care, but for six days, if there's any possibility that you and another person under all circumstances, are going to pass any sort of greeting, then I want you, without exception, to verbally be the one to initiate it, to first say hi. So no consequence for the other person responds verbally, but you be the one to say hi. And of course, a slight smile at least. But hi, hi, hi. <laughs> or in the south, I guess, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> or up north, hiya, or hello. But you do it without exception first to anybody. If there's any possibility that anything's going to happen, any kind of conversation, if it's just two words of hi, hi, or even it's just one, don't you let another person do that to you first for six days. Nobody. Your children, your boss, your employees, strangers. Hi. You do it first for six days without exception, all day long. And that's it.